morning. My name is Sarah Hare and I'm delighted to kick off the BetaShares Shares 2021 webinar program with you again. Um, the first webinar that we are running today is our very popular quarterly economic update with David Bassanese. 2021 Outlook and Opportunities. Thank you for joining us. Before we start today, I will just uh, mention that everything we're talking about is general in nature. Uh, past performance is not indicative of future performance. And before you make any investment decisions, you should do your research and speak with a financial professional. We would love to answer uh, some of your questions. Uh, you can do so uh, by using the widget on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, a session recording will be sent uh, to all attendees and people who have registered this afternoon. So you will get a recording of the session and the slides and please ask your questions to David throughout. A reminder that um, here at BetaShares, we like to keep you informed and we always have uh, insight, information and ideas on our, on our website. Uh, you can subscribe to our weekly insights newsletter and there is also a Monday morning Bassanese Bites, uh, just a snapshot of, of the um, eco landscape from David every Monday morning, things to look out for the week ahead and things that have happened uh, previously. I will also draw your attention to an upcoming webinar uh, for our S&P 500 Equal Weight uh, Fund, QUS. Uh, we will have two sessions um, on, on the 25th of February and we are delighted to be joined by Hamish Preston from S&P who will be joining us from New York. So we will send out a link that you can register and we hope that you can attend. Just a little bit about BetaShares for people who may be joining us for the first time um, or, or who aren't aware. Um, we very proudly have the broadest range of um, ETFs uh, on the, in the Australian market. Uh, we've been uh, operating for over 10 years and have 16 billion in assets under management. Uh, first and foremost, we, we are very proud to uh, bring intelligent investment solutions to meet Australian investor needs. Something else I would like to mention is our cloud, the BetaShares Cloud Computing ETF coming soon, CLDD. Uh, cloud is a portfolio of companies operating in the cloud computing sector. So this is one of the strongest growing segments of the global tech sector uh, and includes companies such as Xero, Shopify, Zoom and Dropbox. Uh, there are There is information on our website and you can register your interest if you would like to be notified when the fund is available on the ASX. Very exciting. It's an Australian first. We are very excited to bring this uh, to the Australian market and we will be um, we will be talking a little bit more about that over the coming weeks. Before we start, uh, we have a couple of polls that uh, David would just to, to check the mood of the room as we always like to do. Um, and just to start with, um, this one talks about the RBA interest rates. So do you think the RBA will keep rates on hold until 2024 as it currently plans? So we know that they've said that they will, but will they actually do it? Started off quite even, uh, and now there's definitely a consensus in, in one direction. Just close that one. And just another, more on the market this time, um, asking you, is the next 10% move in the Australian equity market up or down? 
Are we bulls or bears for 2021? Ooh. This one's a little bit harder to tell. So let me just share with you what you all thought. Uh, so just for the RBA keeping rates on hold, um, it did start off very even, um, but then it just nudged ahead that you think they will commit to that hold for the next three years. And the market's up or down. It's just catching up. A bit more even. So I have to ask Dave to get his crystal ball out um, and take us through it. So um, I hope that you all are familiar with my colleague and BetaShares Chief Economist, David Bassanese. Um, David, we'll just go straight into it. No worries. Thank you. thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sarah, and great to be with you all for 2021, which I hope um, uh, for all of us uh, in terms of the markets and the economy and just um, obviously living with the pandemic or getting through the pandemic is a lot better than 2020. So we're all very hopeful. Um, and I'm sure, as you know, the markets are certainly hopeful and I'll get into that today. So just break up the agenda, uh, do a quick covering off of where we are with regard to COVID-19. Uh, then some of the uh, data in terms of the economy, how the economy is looking and how it's, um, you know, dealing with COVID. Uh, touch on the markets um, and then, you know, some drill down into some specific investment themes within the market. So just let's start with COVID-19. Um, and really the first chart there is just a, you know, it's from a pretty good summary measure. I've got there Europe, the United States uh, and Australia. And what that is, the first chart there is the um, uh, confirmed new cases, a rolling a rolling uh, average, rolling seven day average, and it's as per 100,000 uh, people. So again, it's uh, adjusted for population. Look, bottom line, as you can see, the US uh, has been through its third significant wave of cases in the first chart. Uh, the good news is that it, that at least that third wave does appear to have peaked, and the rate of new cases is coming off. Europe has basically been in a second wave; it's past its peak, but uh, it's still obviously having, you know, the, the rate of cases is still uncomfortably high. For, um, and then Australia, by contrast, as you can see in terms of cases, you know, very, very low on a per capita basis, um, you know, virtually eliminated it um, across the country, uh, which is, um, you know, again, quite an, a, a very good feat. Helps that we've been able to close our international borders uh, in a way that, um, you know, the US and Europe um, haven't done. Um, and we've done, uh, you know, hotel test, uh, hotel uh, quarantining, and you know, really kept a kept a lid on it. And in terms of death rates, I mean, they, you know, they they follow with a lag. So they are they they've also passed their peak in terms of the latest wave, but you know, haven't come down at least uh, as when this chart was put together um, a, as yet. But it seemed it, it certainly would be on the way. So uh, bottom line here, Europe and US still struggling with with the virus for sure, still at very high rates. Um, and were it not for the next chart, as uh, as we'll get to the vaccines, uh, markets I think would be in a lot um, probably more a trickier situation. Uh, and as you can see here, the vaccines are starting to roll out. I mean, those that you know the the, the webinar of last uh, late last year, um, the biggest you know the big news late last year was the fact that you know three viable vaccines were announced almost, you know, within weeks of each other, although in fact they were within weeks of each other, and they are now starting to roll out. So Israel, you know, half the population has now been vaccinated. But importantly, if you look at the UK and the US, um, and obviously in terms of global markets, the US, um, it is starting to roll out. 10% of the population is now being covered, and that's, um, you know, growing by the day. And, um, you know, I'm sure, as you know, we, we're on the cusp of starting to, um, provide the vaccines in Australia as well. So we'll start to get on the scoreboard here and maybe in a few months time when the next webinar comes along, we'll see how we're, we're tracking. But this has been uh, obviously the markets now with the vac rollout of these vaccines, um, somewhat more comfortable with the fact that cases uh, in, in around the world are still uncomfortably high, uh, particularly in Europe and the US. And also the other new things are the fact that the variant, you know, there's new variants of COVID, um, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, but 
at this stage, you know, the, the experts suggest that the vaccines should be able to deal with those variants. But again, all this is not without risk, as I'll touch on in the mark. You know, it's not a flawless rollout here, and there's certainly some risks uh, in terms of this and in terms of the vaccine rollout and new variants to come. Uh, just in terms of the economic outlook, look, what's been pretty remarkable, I think, is that despite um, despite the, uh, the the high level of um, cases still in Europe and the US, um, that the economy itself seems to have continued to rebound reasonably well. So this is the composite PMI indicators. So surveys of, of, of manufacturing and service sector sentiment uh, around the way. As you can see, the US, uh, really, it's at the top end of that, you know, that that sort of Goldilocks zone, around about 55 or so. Um, uh, and Europe, if anything, is the one that's been a bit of a lagger because, you know, they, I, I guess they've, they've dealt with COVID by locking down, you know, having more social distancing restrictions than in the US. So the US has almost had a, um, uh, you know, just sort of live with it and deal with the consequences. They haven't shut down to the same extent Europe has, and as a result, the economy's held up better. Globally, as you can see the uh, on the first slide there, it is in that 50 to 55 zone. So the pace of, of, of activity uh, is, is within a trend pace at the moment. Obviously, the level of activity is still well below where we were prior to the pandemic, but the recovery uh, does seem to be uh, on track at the moment. There's some other charts that highlight that. The next one is about the US labour market. Uh, and as you can see, job, weekly jobless claims, which surged earlier last year, have come back. I mean, they, they, they are still at a high level, but um, they're still, you know, gradually uh, are falling. Uh, they did, I mean, it's hard to tell from that slide, but there was a slight increase in weekly jobless claims uh, late last year when this third wave of COVID hit in the US and you did get some social distancing restrictions reimposed in some cities. Um, we saw a slowdown um, in growth, a slowdown in employment growth and a pickup in jobless claims, but they peaked in early January and now they're coming back down again. And as you can see, if you look at the total employment, an absolute collapse in employment in the US earlier this year, uh, earlier last year, and about half of that employment loss has now been recovered. And, and some of that recovery did slow late last year, uh, with the third wave of COVID. Um, but again, you know, my expectation would be that that will now start to um, uh, pick up the pace. You know, employment growth will start to pick up again um, as we as the vaccines roll out um, and, uh, well, a few other factors that I'll talk about in a minute. Some other in indicators on the US, as you can see here, uh, retail sales, you know, very, very strong rebound after that initial collapse, helped by a a lot of um, the stimulus uh, going the way of households. Um, the uh, the, uh, the ink basically checks given to households to, to spend money. Um, and <clears throat> uh, what we did see is, again, a bit of a slowdown in the la latter part of last year, but just overnight we had retail sales for January come out, which were very strong. So uh, a very strong bounce back. Um, and, you know, the outlook for consumer spending here remains pretty solid. Housing starts also uh, ticking up and durable goods orders, which is a measure of business investment spending in the US, um, again, also, you know, rebounding pretty nicely at the moment. Consumer sentiment still taking a bit of a while to come back in the US, um, but um, certainly it hasn't stopped spending uh, at this stage. And again, because they're dealing with, uh, because COVID is more serious in the US than say in, in Australia, consumer sentiment hasn't rebounded in the same way it has in Australia, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, and this is now focusing on Australia. I mean, this has been quite remarkable. So the first slide there is business sentiment. Uh, the NAB business, uh, uh, um, business survey comes out monthly. Uh, and the key, the key indicator out of that is the, is the summary measure of business conditions. And as you can see, you know, we did collapse and uh, we have rebounded pretty strongly. Uh, and now we're basically actually, would you believe, at, at levels higher than when COVID struck or just before COVID struck. So well above long run average levels. So again, so businesses are feeling confident about the future. Um, and again, it goes to the fact that, you know, stimulus has been very strong in Australia. We've dealt with COVID very well. Obviously, their big, you know, international tourism hasn't rebounded. You know, domestic tourism hasn't rebounded yet, but... Um, uh, businesses are feeling fairly upbeat about the about the future at the moment, and consumer confidence, as you can see there, has also bounced back quite nicely uh, in recent uh, in recent months, helping underpin uh, consumer spending. 
Moving right along, if you look at the labour market numbers as well, um, the, uh, the the grey lines there are the unemployment rate uh, inverted. So when that line's falling, it means the unemployment rate is falling. Uh, and they've got two, two I guess, key measures of uh, uh, hiring intentions or labour hiring intentions. Again, one comes out of the National Business Survey. So it's an employment intentions, you know, hiring intentions uh, indicator. And the other one is ANZ job ads. They, they, they basically do a survey of job, job advertisements online and through the newspapers. Um, and as you can see, both of those have improved quite markedly uh, through the second half of last year. And uh, again, just in the late last year and early this year, the latest reads uh, continued, uh, continue to improve. Um, so that bodes well for further declines in the unemployment rate. So the unemployment rate now has come down from a, a peak of around about 7.5% in Australia to now around 6.6% uh, and on track to probably fall to about 6% uh, by um, by the end of this year. And that's certainly the RBA uh, expect expectation at the moment. And it may even get there sooner depending on, you know, the recovery. But, I mean, the RBA's, if anything, has been a little bit... Um, you know, many of us, have, you know, the, the economy has basically rebounded faster than generally expected. Uh, and the RBA has been, the Reserve Bank has been revising down its in unemployment forecasts. At the moment, expects unemployment to fall to 6% by year end. Uh, but, you know, we may well get there a little bit earlier. Um, other indicators, the housing market, as you can see here. So home building approvals. Uh, have rebounded as well. Again, the uh, the home builder subsidy that the the, the federal government has provided um, has helped underpin um, home buyer activity. So we're seeing first home buyers, you know, get into the market, you know, helped by very very low interest rates. Um, so home lending has has picked up, and I, uh, and 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 um, I don't and in fact. Uh, for those that were with me last in the last webinar, I did have an affordability indicator that suggested home affordability, given the very low level of rates, was actually quite good. Um, and so I would anticipate a pretty good gains in house prices this year. And that has certainly continued. Um, and, you know, more and more people are now jumping on that uh, on that bandwagon. As you can see uh, with the next slide, um, ha housing at ha house prices have started to recover. Um, so they've been up now for several months. And, uh, you know, more and more, I guess, ec uh, um, economic groups around the country are talking about, you know, uh, double digit gains in house prices this year. Um, and again, it's being driven by affordability. Um, there is an issue like going forward. I mean, immigration is obviously uh, fallen away to next to nothing, but home building has picked up. So we do face a um, potential, you know, oversupply in some markets in terms of home building so it's a question of how quickly will immigration rebound to fill that gap but in terms of standalone properties um, and particularly in the in the, the major markets of sydney and melbourne where supply is constrained certainly in those sort of sought after inner city areas um, i think the prospect for house prices is, is really quite solid in the other markets where supply can dampen house prices that may dampen uh, some of the upside in house prices if we get a big building boom uh, and the suburbs expand, and so first home buyers go and buy, you know, home and land packages, and and don't have to bid for properties uh, in a city, in, the, in 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 within the cities, in the way they have to um, in Sydney and Melbourne, for example. But bottom line, the house price story that I, I alluded to, um, you know, a few months ago was certainly nothing has changed on that front. Um, it's still looking, um, you know, quite upbeat. Um, given given the, the very low level of um, uh, interest rates and given the economic recovery we, we um, you know, uh, are enjoying. Just uh, in terms of the, uh, so what other risks to the market, to our, um, to our, uh, to the market, to the economy? What are people worried about? Obviously the China situation uh, is, is one risk where China have imposed some tariffs uh, and some restrictions on exports. I mean, the point I made about this three months ago was that so far, at least, the restrictions have not had a, 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 a not having a macroeconomic impact, and that the sectors involved uh, are, are still relatively small as a share of total GDP. Obviously, for these sectors themselves, it's not great news because China, as you can see from the second table there, are big markets for these these products. So they you know they they're facing you know a major decline in demand in their their major export 
uh, market. So, you know, they need to, you know, try to find other markets or in the case of, say, lobster, for example, I mean, Australians are readily, you know, gobbling up those lobsters and uh, albeit, you know, at, at, you know, somewhat more affordable prices than we would get here. So lobster growers, you know, probably not happy and they're not getting the premium prices they would have got in China, whereas Australian consumers are able to eat their lobsters over Christmas at a, at a somewhat cheaper price. So, you know, there's swings and roundabouts on that. But bottom line here, importantly, China has not escalated you know, we haven't seen any further escalation on this front in the last few months. And so, you know, we're, we're watching. Uh, but again, we've seen no, you know, material escalation in terms of other sectors at the moment. And if anything, they've seemed to be slightly opening up uh, in terms of coal, for example. And again, my expectation is that this will not um, uh, uh, escalate to a point where it does start to have a major macro impact on the economy. Um, just going to the next slide. So if you if you actually just summarise now in terms of the um, aggregate weekly jobless claims, so again this is a nice summary measure of um, of uh, how the economy has been panning out compared to past uh, downturns and recessions. So again, recovery in aggregate weekly hours are still on track, particularly in Australia. Um, compared to, say, the GFC, if you look at that dashed line there. Um, so we are almost, in terms of aggregate weekly hours, worked almost back to where we were prior to the, um, uh, prior to the pandemic hitting. Uh, in, in the US, there's been a bit more of a slowdown in, in the, in the la latter months of last year, as I alluded to. But again, I think the outlook is that that will start to pick up the pace. Um, uh, as, uh, as again, as the vaccines roll out, I think the US and and one thing I haven't mentioned is a big bite, the big uh, renewed fiscal stimulus coming from uh, 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 the new President Biden, 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus that's likely to get through Congress, um, which will help, uh, and something like 1,400 dollars going to virtually every household uh, in the in the country, apart from those on very high incomes, uh, and that will again help support the economy uh, this year. In terms of policy here, I mean, the RBA, you know, no change in terms of the RBA outlook. I mean, and this is really the most pretty remarkable situation where we've got the economy rebounding, but the RBA, you know, inflation is still below the RBA's 2 to 3% target band. And they're basically saying we're going to allow, we, we'd like the economy to, to run strong for a while until such time as the unemployment rate gets low enough uh, that it causes a decent pickup in wages growth. So it's not it's not enough that what inflation gets back to that two to three percent target band. It's actually under that at the moment is around about one point four percent. They actually need they actually want to see wages picking up to say three and a half four percent. Now, at the moment with a six point three percent unemployment, sorry six point six percent, that's very unlikely, uh, and it's not likely until it gets to at least five and a half, if not four and a half percent which on the RBA's forecast is still, you know, two to three years away. So that's really why they're keeping rates down, is that they want to get uh, labour market tight, they want to get wages up. Um, and as they, they, they said in their monetary statement after the last board meeting, you know, it's in black and white here, I've underlined the, the sentence there, the board does not expect these conditions to be met, i.e. Um, a significant gain in employment and return to a tight labour market until 2024 at the earliest. Um, so again, with that question, many people, you know, if, if things uh, come along quicker than that, then they obviously will change their mind. Nothing's set in concrete, but at the moment, uh, that's their expectation. And I think on an inflation ground, at least, they won't have a case to raise rates before then because I don't see wages growth picking up that quickly. If anything, it, the, what may intervene, as I mentioned uh, in the previous webinar, is that, you know, asset prices may get so hot um, that um, globally central banks may reconsider because what the RBA is doing also, it's not alone in this. The European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the US Federal Reserve, they're all essentially promising to keep interest rates on hold for several years uh, because inflation and wages are lower than they would like. So the RBA is basically saying, you know, we can't, you know, unless, unless we follow the herd, uh, we're going to, you know, face a, a much higher exchange rate because everyone will dive into our country if we lift interest rates before anyone else does. So central banks around the world are basically, another way to think about this is almost a prisoner's dilemma because, you know, everyone's got low rates, no one can move. 
uh, because if they did, they would suffer having a higher currency um, and, you know, loss of export competitiveness. And so they're sort of, you know, all caught in this bind at the moment. But ultimately, it comes back down to low wages, low inflation, and central banks more focused on, on that rather than asset prices at the moment. That could change, but at the moment, that is still their, um, their policy uh, forecast. And just looking at the budget situation, and um, I mentioned the budget, the, the Biden uh, 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 stimulus. So the US uh, budget deficit, as you can see, uh, has widened out. Um, it's now approaching almost 100% of GDP. And, you know, this is going to be the challenge for the U.S. longer term is that on current projections, it's, a, you know, uh, by 2050, um, it is expected to get up to 200 percent of GDP. So at some point, at some stage, the, the, but the, the, the U.S. government is going to have to tackle this budget problem. I don't think growth alone will be enough to, um, to curtail that. Uh, because basically taxation is too low relative to their, you know, entitlement commitments. So either they slash their their entitlements, which is largely, you know, pensions and unemployment insurance and, um, you know, um, payments for the less well off, or they have to raise taxes. Um, what, but the, the, if you look at World War Two, the last time, uh, the World War Two, I mean, to some extent, growth will help, but it's probably not going to be enough. And if you look at World War Two. The debt level did get very high, but it basically was was um, uh, the you know the the post war expansion, the the growth in the economy helped lower debt over over time relative to GDP. Uh, and what should also help is is low interest rates. I mean, assume, hopefully, assuming inflation stays low and interest rates stay pretty pretty low, it means the debt servicing won't get too bad. In terms of Australia, things aren't as bad. Um, our, our budget deficit has gone up. So net debt, as you can see here, based on projections. Um, so this is the impact. So that the the, the, the the gray line there is what the net debt to, to GDP projections were prior to COVID. And so we had net debt, you know, around about 15% of GDP by 2023. And now it's up around 40% of GDP. So, you know, 20, you know, tw basically COVID cost us 25, debt of 25% of GDP. Uh, is that that has been the cost of dealing with COVID. So a massive cost, um, but it's, you know, meant that the um, the economy hasn't been as um, negatively affected as it would have otherwise been. Uh, and at the moment, the projections are net debt uh, will peak at around about 40% of GDP and then uh, uh, gradually come down. And so again, uh, certainly uh, higher than we anticipated, higher than we've had in recent years, but certainly at least compared to the US, um, you know, not not as bad. In terms of the market outlook, can the equity market rally continue? Um, look, valuations, as you see, are a bit stretched. So the outright price to earnings ratios are certainly above their long run average. Again, this was the situation a few months ago. Not much has really changed on this front. Uh, interest rates, though, should stay low, which means that PE ratios won't need to come down a lot. Now, there has been a new development on that point on that front that I will uh, allude to, but this is my base case still, and earnings recovery is coming through. So, on a one-year view, I can still see equity markets higher than where they are now, because PE ratios will come off a little bit as interest rates go up, but that will be more than offset by earnings growth. Uh, and as a, as a, we'll, we'll get into, so the first chart here is the uh, U.S. interest rate story, and as you can see, U.S. interest rates uh, have been creeping higher. So the Fed has not changed interest rates. The market is still not counting on any increase uh, in interest rates over the coming 12 months. So that FF12 um, on the first slide there is basically the market's expectation for where the Fed funds rate, which is the US official cash rate, will be in 12 months time. So that's basically saying the market still doesn't anticipate any increase in US official rates for 12 months. But despite that, as you can see, the 10-year bond yield has gone up. It's it's been inching high. It, it bottomed at 0.5 percent midway through last year, um, and it's actually now broken above a one percent. It's actually now just in the last week or so hit 1.25, 1.3 percent. So it's been a pretty chunky move. Not hasn't rattled equity markets at this stage. I mean, after all, you know, 1.3 is still a very very low interest rate, uh, but it's certainly moved higher. So the question is, how far will bond yields rise? Um, how far will bond yields rise um, 
without the Fed raising interest rates. And my modelling suggests they shouldn't rise a lot further. And um, just on the second, if we just go back to the previous slide there, um, you can see I've done some modelling of the 10-year bond yield. And um, what really, what happened, the market overshot to the downside last year, and we've been creeping up to where my modelling suggests 10-year bond yield should be given um, market expectations for, for interest rates. And so we're cre it's crept up to 1.25. Now, it may go up a bit further in the short run, uh, but again, unless the Fed changes its tune, unless we get an inflation scare, uh, I don't think it's going to go too much higher, certainly beyond, say, 1.5% or something like that, which, uh, um, again, I don't think would rattle markets. Now, before we move on, let me just point out there is a near-term risk in that inflation in the US is 1.4%. If it breaks, say, there is talk that it could push higher in the short run because um, some uh, basically supply bottlenecks um, in some markets, uh, demand rebounding faster than production. Some businesses may find they have a short run pricing power uh, and inflation could pr pr break uh, a pick up, uh, a pick up. And in fact, the Fed overnight in their minutes talked about the core inflation measure potentially breaching 2% uh, next quarter uh, from around about 1.4. So it's it's buried in the minutes. But if that were to happen, I mean, that would that could give the markets a bit of a jolt. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a long-run inflation shock, but if you're looking for a reason why equities may pull back in the short run, it could be because inflation does um, spike higher in the short run, bond yields spike higher, and, and the markets come off, PE ratios come off. So I just allude... Uh, to that as a risk. I don't see it as a, a risk to the overall market recovery, uh, but certainly as, a, as, a, as a, a, a reason for why the markets may pull back in the short run. Um, just going to the next slide, in terms of the US equity market situation, I mean, as you can see there, markets have continued to push higher. Interestingly, though, if you look, the PE ratio actually hasn't been moving higher in recent months. It actually hit its peak back in August. And what's been driving the market higher in recent months has been that recovery in earnings in the top right hand slide. And so that's actually continued on in recent months. So forward earnings have continued to rise as market expectations for earnings for both uh, this year and next year, uh, if anything, have continued to be upgraded. And the US just went through its Q4 earnings reporting season. Uh, and again, it was better than expected. Uh, and that we've had upgrades to the earnings outlook. So at the moment, earnings are on track to rise by another 10 to 15% on a 12-month view. Um, meanwhile, if you look at the equity to bond yield gap uh, on the lower uh, right-hand side there, that orange line, uh, again, the P ratio, yes, it's around 20-odd times earnings, but that means the earnings yield is about uh, 5%. Bond yields... Uh, which were around 1%, still gives you an equity risk premium about 4 which is actually not that bad from a long-run point of view. Obviously, the higher bond yields go, the, the narrower that equity to bond yield gap gets. Uh, and and as, as I said, we may get a bit of a correction in the PE ratio uh, out of you know, bit, uh, markets being somewhat scared of the, uh, the, the extent to which bond yields go up. But, you know, from a valuation point of view at the moment, um, it's not a red, you know, in, in interest rates are still low enough to support PE ratios around current levels, in my view, particularly given uh, the prospects for the recovery in growth uh, and earnings. Moving right along, in fact, you know, this is the, the key, and I'll just focus on the bottom slide there. That's the world equity risk premium. So it's the earnings yield of the market, uh, less the bond yield. And so the top slide there is the PE ratio, as you see, the highest level since uh, the GFC 20 odd years ago. But interest rates are much, much lower than they were during the GFC. And so the equity risk premium, which is the lower right hand slide, is actually, you know, certainly well above averages over the past, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, and it's, you know, as you can see there, it's, it, there's been it's been all over the place over the past 50 years. So it's hard to be dogmatic in terms of what is fair value. So I actually think around this current yield. If, if yields stay relatively low, um, you know, the P ratios can stay uh, also relatively high. And, you know, helping that also is the fact that profit margins in the US, if you look at it, I mean, for a long run historical point of view, profit margins on this measure, they used to average around about 60, uh, about 6% 6 of GDP. But for the past decade or so, they've ratcheted up to average around about 9, 10%. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why the PE ratio has also gone up, is that the profit share of the economy uh, has increased. 
Um, it's all part of, you know, workers losing bargaining power, uh, globalisation, technology. But again, this is another reason that sort of supports um, the the PE ratios being elevated. And if you look at it, quite remarkably, yes, the P, the profit ratio margin did decline in the early part of COVID, but it's bounced right back up again uh, in the last couple of quarters. Australian interest rates, look, not much change here. Um, our rates are also moving higher, but again, uh, I don't anticipate our, our rates going, you know, a lot higher either, simply because our, our RBA is on hold. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, we, we're going to follow the, the US essentially, and if the rates there don't move up too far, too fast, neither should our, our rates. Aussie dollar, I still see coming down. Um, I've got some the charts there. If you, obviously, iron ore prices have just continued to go from strength to strength. Uh, so no signs yet of iron ore prices turning around. US dollar looks tentatively as if it's starting to bottom out. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see on that front. But I mean, look, in the short run, the Aussie dollar could easily push higher to say even 80, 81 cents in this economic optimism. But ultimately, I do see the US dollar uh, strengthening in the second half of this year and iron ore prices coming off. So still got the Aussie dollar falling to the lower 70 cent range by year end. Uh, but I definitely don't discount it going uh, a little bit higher in the, in the short run. But that's the, the situation there. And, and it, when I, for the reasons for that, I'll, the, I'll, I'll talk about when we come to thematics in, in a second. Australian equities, look, a very similar situation with the US. P ratio is high. Um, but again, the, the market recovery we've seen since late last year, certainly since around November, has been earnings led, not valuation led. So if you look at that P ratio slide, uh, it peaked at 22, almost 22, and it's come off just under 20 uh, now. And if you look at it, forward earnings have been rising. So it's been an earnings-led uh, recovery uh, in recent times. And again, the equity bond yield gap, that lower right-hand side, around about 4%, again, uh, highlighting that PE ratios are high, um, largely because interest rates are so low. What could go wrong? I mentioned rising interest rates and inflation. Um, again, every month now, markets will be sweating on the core CPI um, numbers. Uh, the, the, uh, and again, if we do get a bit of an upward spike, that would be a moment where you could get a bit of, bit of a pullback in the markets. US tensions with China, again, I don't see those boiling over. I think um, US has got enough on its plate to deal with this year than um, you know, banging the drum about uh, trade tensions, uh, trade issues with China, but we'll wait and see. Uh, but the other one is, uh, Dem, you know, again, the similar thing that I mentioned last time, uh, the uh, what, what Democrats may do with taxes and industry regulation. We've got a very early, early, and I, my argument here has been that the, 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 the majority that the Democrats have in the Senate is, is pretty narrow and they won't be able to do anything too adventurous in terms of raising taxes or, or I mean, re-regulating the tech sector, for example. And we've got an early lead of a uh, hint of that overnight where one of the Democrat members of the Senate basically didn't want to roll in the increase in minimum wages as part of the Biden uh, um, fiscal stimulus package. He wanted to that to be treated separately. Um, and so here's an example of a moderate Democrat who was already, you know, um, be, be being a little bit problematic uh, for them. So it just shows you that, you know, unlike in Australia, that the, it's not a parties don't vote in a block. Um, you've got to get everybody on side. You know, they do, they are quite independently minded over there. So just because they have a, the Democrats do have control of the Senate doesn't mean that uh, the president will get everything he wants uh, or the Democrat leadership will get everything they want uh, in the Senate. Um, just to, turning to investment themes, uh, this is a busy slide, but it really tries to encapsulate a lot of what's going on, you know, in terms of trends across developed markets, uh, Australia versus US, energy and finance. And what you can see here, look, look if anything, the bottom line here is um, the what we've seen since the second half of last year is that the energy outperformance, or sorry, the technology outperformance has been checked somewhat. So technology has gone a little bit sideways. Uh, quality and health and healthcare also has come off a little bit, and what we've seen is that small caps globally have started to um, uh, do better, and and some value parts of the market such as energy and financials with interest rates lifting that helps financials, and oil prices lifting also helps energy, and so as a result, value 
as you can see on that bottom slide there, value parts of the market, which are things like energy and financials versus technology, uh, have started to uh, show signs of outperformance. Um, and I think that may well continue in the short run. But uh, and by short run, I mean, say, till, until, say, the second half of this year. Um, so, you know, financials seem well placed in the short run. You know, BNKS uh, is a global financial. If, if bond yields go, you know, another 25, 30 basis points high here, that could support financials. And oil prices seem to be uh, pushing higher uh, at the moment as well, and that would support the energy sector. So if you wanted to have a tactical tilt in those areas, um, we definitely have uh, ETFs in that area, like um, M N MNRS being the fuel ETF and BNKS being the financials ETF. Um, longer run, though, I still like the technology sector globally. I think it's going to continue to to outperform, uh, but that that may just um, take a little while to to play out again. Um, uh, but meanwhile, uh, again, emerging markets showing signs of uh, our performance as well in the short run. But that's, uh, I think, part of that sort of value, uh, the tilt, to, you know, th and things other than the United States at the moment. P investors globally are trying to find areas other than US tech uh, to invest in. And that's why um, emerging markets have also found some favour. Uh, but also there's a big tech element to emerging markets in particular. And so our Asia technology ETF. Um, has been doing very, very well, and that's been a big player within the emerging markets. Look, in the interest of time, I will just uh, just touch. I did put out a blog on this. If you are interested uh, in this, look at our go to, go to our website and look at the insight section. But this really just summarises why Australia has tended to underperform in the past 12 months. I just thought it'd be of some interest. Bottom line here is you can see that. Uh, there's basically tech, technology and consumer discretionary stocks over the past 12 months have tended to do best. Um, in the last few months, not so much, but certainly on, on 12 month view. And the challenge is that, um, you know, we have a relatively low share uh, in those indices, in particular technology. It's about 3% of our market, as you can see in the middle part of that table, uh, versus global markets, it's 19%. And technology globally has gone up 40%. Um, so that's a big reason why we tend to underperform. Our, so our tech sector has done very well. You know, ATEC, our ATEC ETF has done incredibly well. Uh, but for the market overall, it's only 3% of the market. So that's what holds us back. But more information on all of the, all those aspects is in that uh, Insights um, uh, blog on our, on our website. In terms of thematics, and this is like, in terms of those thematics that I talked about earlier, here are some of the themes uh, in terms of the ETFs that we have. And as you can see, um, really Europe and J Japan's showing some signs of, of pickup. Um, we, 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 again, it's part of that uh, non-US trade. Uh, Europe is still struggling, so the, the European ETF is still struggling. Uh, uh, banks, as I mentioned, are showing some signs of a recovery on the back of rising interest rates. Uh, the food ETF also, food prices have been picking up. Um, as well as which has been supporting the uh, the food um, ETF, um, and um, and and again the other, I mean the other one there the standout is Asia the Asia Tech Fund uh, on the uh, to to the uh, to to the left there. So technology, particularly in Asia, I mean although the the Nasdaq is sort of relative performance has levelled off somewhat, certainly Asian technologies continue to go absolute gangbusters. And the other one in the technology theme that uh, I continue to like is cybersecurity, PAC, uh, and global robotics. And as you can see, uh, they have continued to outperform. So all of these charts are relative performances to the global MSCI index. So when they're going up, it means they're actually outperforming the global index on, on these slides. Um, the high income globally, as you can see, that's still been a tale of woe. So infrastructure related um, uh, exposure and also energy, I mean, the, the part of uh, the higher income parts of the global market, as in Australia, is global energy, uh, electricity utilities, uh, which with the shifts in um, with the, into clean energy and whatnot, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're starting to find their, their models are a little bit challenged. So any anyone relying on producing, uh, you know, electricity by coal at the moment is certainly being challenged. And so that plus the hurt to uh, airports, toll roads is certainly hurting. Um, Australia, the same sort of story. Um, if you look at it there, uh, um, ATEC, I mean, the technology sector in Australia has continued to go from strength to strength. 
Um, resource is also doing very well on the back of uh, high iron ore prices. Uh, financials also starting to show signs of outperformance with um, you know, the bad debt situation, the banks not being as bad uh, as, as, uh, as feared and the economy basically round, re rebounding uh, better than expected. Small caps also doing very, very well, SMLL at the, the lower slide there. Uh, and the, I guess the you know the, where the, the the market that stood the sort of unloved parts of the market are the in, the higher income funds and the the infrastructure funds. So they've continued to underperform. Um, so if there's some value uh, in our market, which is probably you know stands to benefit as we do come out of COVID, it could be though the infrastructure part of our market, uh, which you can get exposure through through the the RINC um, uh, fund uh, RI. Uh, R I N C. Um, again, the toll roads, the the utilities, um, still still struggling in terms of relative performance. Uh, look, in the interest of time, I won't go through these too much, but that that just spells out some of the various exposures that we do have in terms of resources, small caps, emerging markets, quality, technology, Nasdaq. So, in terms of those growth exposures, I mean the ones I did highlight there: ATAC, ATEC in Australia, Hack, Robots, Asian Technology. And the value exposures there, you know, which in the short run, I think, you know, can um, uh, do well. Uh, financials and fuel on the back of rising uh, bond yields and, and oil prices and, and Japan to some extent as well. And the final one is equal weight. We do have a, a new ETF, which is an equally weighted exposure to the US market. And uh, so basically it's the S&P 500, but each, each stock gets about 0.25% share. Uh, a very simple approach, but as you can see on this slide, over time it does actually outperform the index. And the beauty of it is that it tends to outperform at times where the the sort of the large cap momentum driven types of exposures such as NASDAQ uh, don't do well. So blending the two exposures, uh, equal weight and NASDAQ, um, as you can see over time, can give you a smoother ride. Um, but also, you know, generally it tends to outperform the S and P 500. So it's a different. So again, it's a way of getting value, a value tilt within the U.S. market, and uh, a, a diversify away from the big fang stocks that currently now dominate the U.S. market, uh, and does tend to outperform uh, over time. And and in fact, you know, in, a, in an environment where value may outperform for a while, um, that may be um, uh, may be a, a good exposure. So look, I'll leave it at that, and uh, hopefully we've got some time for questions. Thanks, David. Um, great. Uh, interesting as always. Um, yeah, just some things to consider. Uh, I did highlight at the start of the session. Um, invest, investment risk. Um, please do your research before you, you make any investment decision. Um, this, this webinar has contained general information only uh, and there is plenty of information and the PDS is available on every fund on the fund page on our website. Um, I, I do appreciate that we are at time, so if you do need to jump off, um, I will remind you that we will send a recording of the session and the presentation uh, to the email address you have provided. But we'll just take a few questions because there um, are quite a few. Um, David. Uh, there's quite a few. So look, if just start off nice and easy, um, your view on the gold price for the rest of 2021, uh, could it possibly drop to US uh, $1,500? Uh, yeah, look, I'm not bullish on the gold price. I mean, again, regular attendees to this webinar know I've cooled on the gold price um, since midway uh, last year. And as you can, as we're seeing, it's basically a bond yield story. As bond yields have been going up, gold prices have been going down, notwithstanding the fact that the US dollar has been weakening also. So it's a, uh, and look, at, so with global recovery, bond yields sort of, in, you know, creeping higher. And in fact, they may, you know, spike a little bit higher than in the short run, as I alluded to. It's not an environment where gold should go up and, you know, um, and I don't see inflation breaking out. I mean, what we also tend to be seeing at the moment, it seems to be at least, to the extent people do worry about currency debasement uh, and in global inflation, um, you know, current, uh, central banks trashing their currencies. I mean, I think all that talk is is overdone, but people that used to fear that used to buy gold. These days, they seem to be buying Bitcoin. So that's that's been the, become the new uh, flavour of the month. So, um, 
Yeah, so uh, I don't, uh, wouldn't surprise me if gold continues to, to gradually weaken in this environment. And a, and a perfect segue into another question that we've got here, um, and just a broader comment on cryptocurrency. So I uh, can't figure out what's, what's making it jump so much. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on a, on a price increase of almost three, three times in the past three months? Look, again, I, I'm, not a, I, I'm very dubious about cryptocurrencies myself. Um, look, and I don't, you know, completely valid if people do want to invest in them. People have different opinions about their value, but um, I, I kind of think it's a bit of a speculative bubble that's developing at the moment with crypto. I mean, problem with it, you can't value it. It's just impossible to value. I mean, I just don't, again, so I'm, I'm put me in the cynics camp, um, but, you know, and one thing, and again, I mentioned this uh, a few months ago, one new development on this um, is that, you know, more and more serious players are buying uh, cryptocurrency like Tesla, um, you know, Elon Musk bought it. Some of the big Wall Street banks are now looking to invest in it. So it's becoming legitimised some, to some extent, which means that regulators will have it, if they were going to outlaw it, uh, they've basically run out of time to do that because now when you've got serious players investing in it, and who knows, there may be ETFs uh, uh, that track uh, Bitcoin um, in the future. It, it means it's getting legitimacy, and I think that's adding to the, um, the, um, the you know, demand at the moment is the fact that, you know, the risk of it being outlawed uh, is diminishing. But where can it go? I have no idea. So, I mean, it could easily go to $100,000. It could collapse to fifteen thousand dollars. I have no idea. Yeah, um, but you, you are right. It's certainly in the news every day, and um, and Elon Musk and, and the likes of Kathy Wood talking about it. So um, you certainly just want to watch, I suppose. Um, David, a question here uh, about the U.S. Fed uh, is likely not to react on short-term inflation rates, though. So um, those inflation rates going up, and the and the Fed won't won't react to that. What's your comment there? Yeah, I think they won't. I mean, they they again. If you read the minutes overnight, I think they're at pains to point out that they 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 fully anticipate. In fact, the the Fed staff have forecast, and they've got it in the minutes that they they actually forecast next quarter, uh, i.e., March, June. Uh, you know, April, uh, April, May, June. So April, May, June. At some point, uh, core inflation, may, the annual rate, may tick up to two percent. But they think it's because basically it was pushed down unusually uh, low. Um, you know, it was pushed down through COVID, and now we're going to get a bit of a, a bounce back uh, from that. But they don't see that as a, as a start of a, of a of a more serious lift. In fact, they think it'll drop back down below two percent uh, by the end of the year. And again, it's underpinned by the fact that inf wage inflation uh, is not really, uh, you know, breaking out in, in a big way at the moment. So the the Fed is certainly of a view to look through it, but I think what the, and as I point out, the mark the market may get sticker shock though. So I mean, if you do get a two handle on the, the on the number, then you may just get the market reacting negatively to it. So I just pose that as as a risk. And again, if you're you're not fully invested in the market. That could be an opportunity, you know, for a bit of a pullback in the market. So um, it's very hard to forecast when corrections in the market can come through. But the markets have run very hard. Um, there's a lot of, you know, good news and optimism priced into them. Um, so you know, there could be, you know, scope for a pullback. Um, but again, I wouldn't. That wouldn't make me, you know, bearish on the market to this point. It'd just be an opportunity, I think, to take some exposure. Um, and and a great and another great uh, sort of segue. We haven't mentioned BBOZ, and and for those that are not familiar, BBOZ uh, is our um, strong bear uh, fund against the Australian market uh, with over sixty or with sixty funds. It is hard to mention, and and really not relevant to mention every fund uh, in in David's economic outlook. So. Uh, it's not that we we're not mentioning it for any reason, but you know, we David mentions the funds that he thinks are relevant. Um, we haven't mentioned BBOZ, David. So, you know, what what's the well, sort of out, outlook on on shorting? Well, I, I mean, BBOZ. Let's be clear. BBOZ is a is a uh, um, inverse. You know, it's a sort of um, 
uh, it basically designed to go down when the market goes up. So the market's been going up, BBOZ has been going down. We do, yeah, that, that's the, so, you know, don't blame us for the fact that BBOZ has gone down because that's what it's designed to do. Uh, we, we promise to do no more than, than give you the, in, the, you know, the, the reverse of what the market is doing. Um, so, you know, people have used BBOZ for hedging purposes or, 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 or you know, punting on the market going down in the short run, and which is perfectly valid. I mean, if you fear the market going down and you want to hedge some of your exposure, that's what BBOZ is there to do. That way, you know, if the market goes down, what you lose on paper in terms of your shares, you make by BBOZ, and so then you can sell at a profit and, and you know, sort of uh, put that back into the shares that you lost. So you're effectively going to cash to some extent by buying BBOZ as a hedge. But other people also, if you, if you think the market's going to go down in the short run and you want to take a punt on that, BBOZ will go down. But you know what? If you, if the market goes up, BBOZ will go down because that's all it's all all it uh, that's all it's designed to do. It's an indexed uh, ETF. Um, look, in the interest of time, David, I will leave it there. There are some specific questions uh, about our funds, and as usual, our team will contact you directly to answer those. Um, and then we'll also like to follow up with some of the, the more common questions um, in our insight section and answer those FAQs. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. As I mentioned, a lot of exciting uh, webinars coming up with our QUS webinar um, and a lot of um, exciting announcements on the product front with our cloud, so Australia's first uh, global cloud computing ETF. So we're off and running for 2021. Thank you very much, David, and I look forward to many more webinars to come. No worries. Bye for now. Thanks, David.